Uh, question on the Eucharist. If a Catholic is given communion with a non-consecrated host, but is not aware that it is not consecrated, is the act of con communion valid? No, of course not, because you don't have the valid Eucharist. So certainly, if it's a non-consecrated host, certainly it's not the Eucharist, and it wouldn't be a valid sacrament. Is it valid when communion is given to non-believers? Well, the Eucharist itself, if it's validly consecrated, if you have the form and matter of the sacrament, it's a valid sacrament. So the Eucharist is the Eucharist. If the Eucharist is valid, it's valid, regardless of who it's given to. Now, it's another question of, of, of is that licit to do that? Norm, normally it isn't. There are certain very specific conditions which the church has laid down. First of all, the bishop has to give a specific permission for that, number one. Number two, that person has to ha spontaneously ask for the sacrament. Number three, that person has to believe what the Catholic Church believes. Not that it's only a sign or symbol, but that it's in fact Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And last, have the required dispositions, be in a state of grace, approach it with, with reverence. But those are very specific conditions, and only the bishop can grant that. Nobody else can grant that. The bishop makes that decision. At a certain place, don't get me in trouble by, by <laughs> putting names here, uh, but I, I won't, I would never mention it. But at a certain place, they give communion to everyone. Uh, sometimes uh, these people aren't Catholic. Sometimes these people aren't even baptized. Sometimes these people don't even have any religion. Well, obviously, that's not the intention of the church. We don't want to do that. We don't want to profane that which is holy. What about in a, you're, you're someplace and you have a mixed group? There are Catholics there. There are pe other Christian denominations. There are some Jewish people, maybe people that don't practice any religion, and it's time for communion. What do you do? Well, you have to make an announcement. You know, you do not encourage everyone to come to the Eucharist. That is not the mind of the church. And I don't care who does it, that's not the mind of the church. You do not approach the Eucharist unless you have the capacity to approach the Eucharist, and that means you're a Catholic, you're in a state of grace. Or if you're a Christian who's not a Catholic, the bishop has given specific permission for that person that person spontaneously requests the Eucharist. That person is in a state of grace. That person believes what we in the Catholic Church believe about the Eucharist. And on, there's no exception other than that. Oh, here's one bound to get me in trouble. Uh, gee, if I was prudent, I probably wouldn't even deal with these, but. You know, people ask questions, and they have a right to answers, really. So I'm very much averse not to answering hard questions. I like to answer them, not because I like to answer them, but because you deserve an answer to your questions. Uh, a certain priest is a member of Call to Action, uh, of whom the good bishop of Lincoln, Nebraska, said, among other groups, that they are excommunicated. Time is running out. They're already under interdict if they haven't gotten out of those groups. Planned Parenthood is one of them, call to action, and so forth. Now, if this priest would to move to Lincoln, Nebraska, does he become excommunicated if he stays in that, in that group? Absolutely. Excommunicated. No question about it. Does the bishop have the ability to do that? You bet he does. You bet he does. He, he can do it, and he did do it, even though they're debating it and will continue to debate it. In that diocese, that bishop has made a stand. He has said, enough. We have to clarify things. There's too much confusion.
Recently, at a meeting um, of a group of religious superiors, a very large meeting, Bishop Bruskowitz was a speaker there. He received a 10-minute standing ovation, 10 full minutes standing ovation from uh, over a thousand people. Uh, some people think that what he did was not a good thing to do. Well, you know, I, I don't like to second-guess bishops. Uh, bishops have a grace that I certainly don't have, uh, any bishop, and so I don't like to second-guess them. But I'll tell you this, if you pur purport to be Catholic and you say that it's okay for a woman to choose to have an abortion, you don't believe what the Catholic Church believes. You have actually excommunicated yourself in virtue of the act itself. If you hold the position, even today, after all the clarification, that a woman can be ordained a ministerial priest, you are, you've fallen into a trap that is a post-baptismal, obstinate denial of a truth of Catholic faith which must be accepted with divine and Catholic faith. That's heresy by definition, and canon law calls for immediate, latte sententiae excommunication. And so the people who do that cut themselves off. The church doesn't do that to them. They do it to themselves. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that at all. It's not a good thing to do, to cut yourself off from the church. If someone receives a sacrament and they are not in a state of grace, will the effect of the sacrament work, la work later after the person has confessed? Depends what the sacrament is. Okay? Now, confirmation, matrimony, holy orders, uh, several of the sacraments. If you're not in a state of grace, you still receive the sacrament, but it's not efficacious the grace of the sacrament doesn't operate. So later you go to confession. That sacrament is resuscitated. It's brought to life. And then it begins to operate in you. So if, if you're, uh, one of the questions said, when I was married, the, the priest brought us right to confession before we were married. He said we had to go to confession. And today, um, I don't see that anymore. Well, it's, it's certainly Necessary, of course. You have to receive the sacraments in a state of grace. You may receive the sacrament, but the grace of the sacrament won't operate in you. No grace of a sacrament operates in you if you're dead, except penance or anointing of the sick. They're called sacraments of the living, many of them. The Eucharist is a sacrament of the living. If you had a dead body, a cadaver, and you gave them a nice T-bone steak, would that body profit from the food? No. Well, dead souls don't profit from the food of the Eucharist. They have to be living. Eucharist is a sacrament of the living. The sacrament of confirmation. You can receive the sacrament, but it doesn't work. It doesn't operate in grace. You don't receive the fruits of the sacrament until you're in a state of grace. But yes, go to confession, it's resuscitated. And so then you receive the grace. Not with the Eucharist, though. Okay? You receive the Eucharist in mortal sin. And later you go to confession. What about that, Conf that Eucharist before? No. No, that was a sacrilegious communion. And you don't receive grace from that. Okay. Um, I often see people coming to church late on Sundays and holidays. Sometimes they, they come only in time to receive communion. At what point during the Mass has one totally missed the Mass and is required to go again? Well, going from the Church's teaching that the Eucharist is an, an integral celebration, the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist constitute one single act of worship. You better get there for the Liturgy of the Word. That's an essential part of the Eucharist. The Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist constitute one single act of worship. So my advice on it is get there, it, you know, before the readings start, certainly. Try to get there before that. 
but at least by the time the reading starts, because if you miss the liturgy of the word, or most of it, then you've missed that which is an essential part of that single act of, of worship. If the consecration is read nonstop from be beginning to end with no genuflection or bowing or elevation, is this a valid consecration? Well, it could be. If the form and the matter are correct, if you have wheat bread and wine and the priest has the intention to do what the church does, and if he uses the words of institution, the proper words of consecration, you have a valid consecration. Now, whether he genu now you're supposed to do what the church does, but it's valid. It's valid. Whether he genuflects or not, uh, whether he uh, elevates the host or not, it's still a valid consecration. Now, some of those things, leaving them out, makes it illicit, but not invalid. You know, you still have a valid um, celebration of the Eucharist. Uh, we should do what the church tells us to do, but um, it's not that easy, really, to invalidate the Mass. There aren't too many invalid Masses, really, uh, thanks be to God. But there could be. You know, it's possible. I gave you the conditions. If a priest does not believe in transubstantiation, can he truly confect the Eucharist validly? Does he have the necessary intention? What does the communicant receive? Well, the words are, the basic norm is, you have to intend to do what the church does. You have to intend to confect the Eucharist. Okay, you have to intend to celebrate the Eucharist. And that's all the church says about it. Now, where the line is, is it's just hard to say. A lot of people believe or don't believe a lot of things, but if the basic intention to celebrate Mass is there, I would have to say it's a valid Mass. Uh, and I know these are hard, difficult situations we run into, but you want to always, always give the benefit of the doubt. Always give the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, sometimes poor priests get put in a terrible position. They get badgered and beaten on, and they're really not so bad as you might think. Now, sometimes, sometimes we may be misinformed or have funny ideas, but try to give the benefit of the doubt. And by all means, if you run into this, please, please, uh, pray. Pray and offer sacrifice. Uh, you don't know what priests go through, they're a target. The devil would rather destroy a priest than anybody else, and so he levels his most virulent poison, his, his worst darts are leveled at a priest. Why? Because strike the shepherd, scatter the sheep. You know, that, that's a, a very definite axiom the enemy uses. That, that, that's a tactical warfare, right? If you can subvert the faith of a priest, you can really cause confusion in the ranks. So we need to pray very much for our priests. It's not easy to be a priest. They under we, we, Terrible uh, things, uh, persecutions in a spiritual way befall many, many a priest. And always think this way, uh, except for the grace of God, there go I. I could be a thousand times worse than someone that we think has lost the faith or something. Everything's grace. And so be very charitable, be very kind, be very understanding, but also, you know, be solid. Be solid in your faith. Uh, should we receive Holy Communion if it is a prayer service and not Mass? Well, if I, sometimes in some places, they don't have a priest every day, and so a religious or a Eucharistic minister will celebrate a prayer service, a paraliturgical service, and I certainly would re the Lord is the Lord. Now, the ideal is to receive the Eucharist at the Holy Mass, certainly. I would want to do that. But if it's not possible, it's still the Eucharist, you know, and, and so I would receive the Lord at a prayer service or a, a paraliturgical um, service, certainly. I wouldn't want to do that every day and not have Mass, though. You know, the grace of the Mass is, is something very special. Now, we still receive the grace of Holy Communion when we receive the Eucharist, when we're in the hospital, or at a prayer service. So I wouldn't hesitate. 
Okay, you mentioned that the liturgy of the Mass must be said according to the teachings or rubrics of the Church. Is it okay for priests to personalize the Mass? Well, there, some of that can be done. You know, the priest has some leeway. Now, the problem is you want to be very careful. You know, this, don't discredit yourself and your, you know, orthodoxy in the faith by jumping to conclusions. Um, it's, it's easy, a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. And, well, Father might have not um, washed his hands, you know, the lavabo. He might not have done that. Well, we, sh we should do what's prescribed. No getting around it. We should. But don't be quick to call him a heretic or say that it's an invalid mass or something, because it's not. Not heresy. It's not an invalid mass. You know, um, sometimes Father has a reason for this or that, and so don't be too quick to pound on him or to confront him. If you have to bring these things up, and sometimes we do in charity, but you better pray a lot before you do it. You pray and, and, and do some fasting or something because you don't want to be mean and you don't want to be uncharitable and you don't want to be impatient. You know, if the Holy Spirit honestly moves you to say a kind word to your priest, do it like, definitely as a kind word with all patience. You know, preserve the peace. But sometimes we do have to give a word to the wise. And, and even we priests, you know, I've had people straighten me out. You know, it rubs us all the wrong way, I know. Uh, and sometimes, I'll tell you an occupational hazard of being a priest. An occupational hazard of the priesthood is, generally the people of God are very good to us. They are very kind to us, very respectful. They hold us in esteem, and that's good. But it can go to your head. And pretty soon, you begin to believe all those nice things that everybody says about you, and then when somebody points out something that's true, that you should have sufficient humility to accept, you don't, you blow up. Like a hand grenade going off, right? Push the wrong button, look out. Well, it's kind of an occupational hazard, and we priests have to constantly pray for humility. So if, if you need to speak a word to your priest, do it with great respect, do it with great charity and you'll have a much better chance of getting your point across that way, too. For those who are already confirmed, but did not realize the true meaning of the sacrament at that time, do those gifts from the Holy Spirit still reside in that person? Well, like I said before, you receive the sacrament, but if you weren't properly disposed, uh, let's say you're in a state of grace at least, but you don't, you're not particularly intense in your spiritual life. You're not very open to the spiritual life. So the grace of the sacrament operates at some level. You receive some of that grace. Yes, those gifts operate at a low level. But as you increase your, the intensity of your faith, you enter more deeply into prayer, you become more faithful in your sacrifice, your worship, your acts of virtue, the gifts of the Holy Spirit increase in you. Remember, according to your disposition. And so, yes, you have the gift, as long as it was a valid sacrament, you receive the sacrament, you're in a state of grace, the gifts operate, but they might operate at a very low level. They admit of a tremendous uh, number of degrees. And it's like the saints, you know? Uh, you can take someone who's barely, you know, they're in a state of grace, but does the, the Holy Spirit operate the same way it would in, in Mother Teresa? or St. Francis of Assisi, oh no, there's a tremendous variation. Common sense tells us that. Uh, what about the Christian denominations who do not baptize or who do not follow proper baptismal form? Quakers, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. Well, if you do not have valid baptism, you're not a Christian denomination, for one thing, because to be a Christian denomination, you have to have valid baptism. Invalid baptism consists of immersion or pouring with water while saying the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, if they do that, they intend to baptize and they do that, it's a valid baptism. But if they don't pour the water or immerse in water, they have no water, and they don't use that formula, then there's no valid baptism and it's not Christian. It's not a Christian denomination. Even if they say they're a Christian denomination, 
You need valid baptism to be a Christian denomination. Uh, regarding what you said earlier that baptism and matrimony doesn't necessarily need a priest, who else can validly officiate the sacrament of matrimony aside from the priest? Well, okay, the ministers of the sacrament of matrimony are the spouses. The sacrament is ministered by the spouse, one to the other. Each, you know, it's a mutual ministering. The priest or the deacon witnesses, witnesses the celebration of the sacrament. That's why in mission countries like in the Philippines, where my order is very uh, active in the Philippines and some of the out islands of the Philippines, um, you, you can't get a priest there or you can't get a, a deacon there. Those are the, the ordinary ministers of baptism um, or, or, in, or matrimony too. Priest, deacon, bishop. You have no priest, you have no deacon. Well, they, the bishop, can uh, give the faculties to do that to a lay person, a religious sister. And what do they do? They witness the sacrament for the church. Now for a Catholic, that's necessary for validity, right? We need to have the form, valid form. And that's what a defective form annulment is. A Catholic who gets married without the proper form of the sacrament, meaning that you have to have that, that marriage witnessed by the church, by priests, deacon, someone that the priest, the pastor, or the bishop has, has um, given the faculties to witness, that then it's invalid because of form. Okay, so uh, the priest and the deacon or the bishop witnesses matrimony. They don't minister the sacrament. Matrimony is the one sacrament where the two people minister to each other. Husband to wife, wife to husband, the church witnesses that. Is com communion at a Greek Orthodox, Byzantine, and Russian Orthodox valid for a Latin Rite Roman Catholic? Okay, we've got to separate these. Let's put them in two categories. Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. Uh, they have valid sacraments. Byzantine, right, of course, has valid sacraments. They all have valid sacraments because they have a valid priesthood, because they have right of succession, apostolic succession through the sacrament of holy orders. Uh, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox are not uniate. They're not in union. The Eastern Schism that took place nine centuries ago or so, um, they, they don't accept the primacy of Peter, the Pope. All right, so they're separated from us, but they have valid sacraments, and they're very close to us, and we're working through dialogue to uh, enter into union. Um, the Byzantine rite is a different category. That's a uniate rite. Byzantines are Catholic. You know, Byzantine, Maronite, uh, Coptic rite, these are all uniate, meaning in union with the Pope. And so they're Catholic. So certainly you can go to those uh, rites anytime. You can go to a Byzantine rite mass, and, you know, it's per perfectly fine for you. Uh, in, in a danger of not being able to receive the sacraments over an extended period of time, uh, you could get permission to go to a Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox church. They have valid sacraments. Uh, we should try to go to a uniate church, you know, assuming there is one. But let's say you live in the outskirts of Mongolia, and the only thing there is uh, a Russian Orthodox church, and you just can't receive the sacraments any other way. Would it be valid sacraments for you? Oh, yeah, sure, they have valid sacraments. Would you be receiving Jesus in the Eucharist? Yes, yes, absolutely. And so the Orthodox in all those Eastern rites, perfectly valid sacraments. How do we combat the charge that the receiving of Holy Communion is cannibalism? Well, that goes way back. That goes right back to the Lord's own time. That's what they really thought then. Who, who can accept this? You know, if it's his own body and his own blood, uh, that's cannibalism. Who, who can abide by that? And they went away. And so how do we answer that? Well, the answer is that although it is in fact the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, it's a sacramental presence. It is his presence. It is real. But it's a spiritual, sacramental presence. In the end, it's a mystery. And if you try to figure it out and use your puny little brain too much, you'll hurt yourself. 
the fact of the matter is we can't figure it out perfectly. Why? Because it's a transcendent truth. If you were to understand everything that God teaches through his church, you would have to have the mind of God. Now, how could I understand everything about God and the things of God unless I had the mind of God? And I don't. Therefore, I grope. I do the best I can, but I fall short. And so I accept what the church teaches. I understand it as best I can. And then I abandon myself to God's love. I, I trust. I trust that God gave us his church to lead us and to instruct us in the truth. I received communion at my father-in-law's funeral service. It was a Methodist church. I was uncertain if I should receive or not. I asked God to forgive me if I did wrong because I really didn't know. Okay, well, that's, that happens. You know, that, that can happen to us, and, and we can become confused. But the, the general norm is we don't receive communion in other denominations. In the first place, uh, it's a sign. Uh, you know, they celebrate the Lord's Supper. They reverence it. They have the signs of bread and wine, sometimes grape juice. And as a sign, it's fine. You know, that, that's what they have, and we have to respect what everybody believes, but it's not what we believe. And so we can't partake in that communion because that's not our understanding of communion. So, so out of respect, when sometimes I go, uh, I've, I've preached in Baptist churches. I, I preached in the South at an AME Zion Baptist church one time, and, and it was great, but I, I didn't partake in, in communion. And not to be disrespectful, to be respectful to be respectful. Just like some of my Protestant friends when they come to Catholic Church and even some ministers, they're respectful. They're very respectful of our faith. They're not offended. They're respectful of our, of our faith and what we believe. And so they don't attempt to partake of the Eucharist because that would be like uh, a statement that I believe what you believe. And they say, well, I can't say that, Father. I, I don't believe what you believe. I respect what you believe. But I don't believe what you believe. So that they respect us, and we have to respect them in the same way. Please mention the indult mass celebrated in Latin and encouraged by the Holy Father. People may get the impression that we are schismatics. No. The Holy Father has given permission. He's given an indult, an exception, for the celebration of the Mass, not only in Latin, but the Tridentine Rite. It's, you don't, you're not a schismatic if you are celebrating that with the proper permission. Now, the Latin Mass is very beautiful. Don't get the wrong idea from what I said before. Uh, I made a statement that for, for me and for many, being able to pray the Mass in our own language can be very helpful. Now, some have said, but I find the Latin Mass more helpful because it's so much more reverent. You know, the sense of the sacred seems to be so much more alive. I know what you're talking about. I, 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 I don't disagree with that. It's not a question of the language in that case. It's a question of how the Mass is celebrated. Now, if you had a so-called Novus Ordo, and it's not really a, a new order, but if you had a Novus Ordo celebrated in Latin or in English or in any other language, and if it would be done correctly, with great reverence, care with what you're doing, that can bring you into a deep sense of prayer too. And so it's not so much the language as the way the Mass is celebrated. So if, you, if it helps you to uh, assist at a Mass celebrated in Latin, fine. There's, there's nothing wrong. You have permission to do that. That's perfectly okay. Uh, you know, there's permission at a couple places in this diocese that I know of for that. Vatican II didn't do away with Latin. Let's clarify the whole thing. Uh, it did not. It reiterated that Latin is the official language of the liturgy of the Western Rite, the Latin Rite, the Roman Rite. Latin is the normative language of the Roman Rite. An exception was granted to be able to celebrate Mass in the vernacular. And I'm just saying that that exception turns out to be, in a way, a blessing. If it were done the way it should be done, it's a great blessing. Why? 
because, now I can read Latin, I studied Latin, I, it would not be as crushing a blow for me as it would be for some people, but I'll tell you something, I can't pray the Mass, all right, the words of the Mass, I can't pray them from the heart without being able to think in that language. There's just a certain layer there that impedes me. Now, you're, you're, you have to know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to enter actively into the prayer of the Mass. Now, admittedly, in Latin, very often, the Mass is celebrated very reverently. And that, and that in itself, with beautiful music, Gregorian chant, that helps you to draw you in to a reverence and a sense of the sacred. That's good. That's very good. That's helpful. But it's not necessary that it be in Latin. I'll tell you, you can do that in English or in any language. But what's happened is, very often, in the words of Cardinal Ratzinger, the celebration of our liturgies has become mundane and lackluster. It doesn't have to be that way, though. And so there's nothing wrong with celebrating Mass in Latin, assisting in the Latin Mass, as long as the bishop is given permission, and he has in this diocese. If the wine is taken out of Mass, does not that go against Jesus' teaching of the New Covenant? Well, I'm not sure what that question means. Obviously, you have, you have to have wine as well as bread for a valid celebration of the Eucharist. It's the bread and the wine that through the mystery of transubstantiation is changed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Now what they might mean in this question that some places we're not allowed to receive uh, the precious blood. And by the way, don't ever call it wine after the consecration. It's not wine anymore. It's not wine. I even, it drives me crazy, Eucharistic ministers even say, well, I, I'm going to minister the wine today. No, you're not. You know, it was wine before. It's the precious blood of Jesus now. That's what it is. We, we have to be careful with words because pretty soon, you know, those words can gradually erode our faith. If we think it's wine, pretty soon we believe that it isn't Jesus, but only a symbol and not really him. So, you receive the entire Jesus under one species or any part of one species. If you received a little fragment of the host, would you receive the entire Christ? Yes, of course. If you receive one drop of the precious blood, would you receive the entire Christ? Yes, of course. But receiving under the form of both species, we receive the consecrated host, body of Christ, we receive the precious blood. That's a fuller sign. We're dealing with sign value here. It is a fuller sign. And, and yes, that is something good. And so it, it's a good thing to receive under both species, but it doesn't con concern at all what we're receiving. One or both, it's still the entire Christ. And so if some places you don't receive the precious blood as well, well, it's not as full a sign, but it's still what's important. It's Jesus, the whole Lord. You're not lacking anything. Are miscarried or stillborn babies taken care of by the parents' desire to have them baptism? Not necessarily. There is no solid teaching on this, but I'm going to tell you something, okay? At this point, I, you know, if I were doing this on a computer, I'd put this in brackets and move it off someplace. I'm not teaching you here the doctrine of the faith, okay? That, that's what I'm here to do, is teach you the doctrine of the faith and the catechism. But let me just give you um, something that I believe myself as a theologian, I believe that this is, is a reality, but there's no formal teaching on it. You have, let's say, a baby who's aborted, a stillborn baby, someone who dies without baptism, an adult, uh, someone who's killed in a car accident and you think they're not in a state of grace. Is there any hope? Well, of course, there's always hope. We're all one in the body of Christ. All right. From all eternity, I'm going to speak now because I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to speak this way. Maybe somebody in here needs to hear it. Let's say you're a woman who's afraid. You're young, you become pregnant. You have an abortion. 
later, you regret it very deeply. You are very sorry, and it begins to eat at you, begins to really tear at your conscience. And what can you do after all? You, you begin to think the devil starts working on you too. Well, you did it. You killed the baby. It's too late. Nothing you can do. Not true. Let me tell you something. God is in eternity. God's not merely in time. He's in eternity. From all eternity, he knew you would repent, and he knew you would pray for that baby. And God can reach into the future, and he can take your prayers and your good life, and he can take them back to the moment of that abortion, and he can apply grace. And that baby can receive a special blessing. And that baby then can be shown the faith. Even though it doesn't have the use of reason, God can give it the use of reason for a moment to choose. And the child chooses God. Yes, I would will to be baptized if I had the chance. And the baby can be saved. That's a kind of anticipatory grace, I call it. It is a grace of anticipation. You can pray. You can pray today for someone who committed suicide 25 years ago. God is in eternity. God knew from all eternity you would pray for that person 25 years hence. God, because he's God and precisely because he's God, can reach into the future. He can take your prayers. He can apply them at the moment of that suicide. That person on the way off the bridge can repent and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And they are saved because of your prayers. That is an anticipatory grace. God is in eternity. God can use your prayers efficaciously. And so I pray for all the aborted babies. I pray for anyone who commits suicide. I pray for everybody in despair. I, I pray for Hitler. You say, oh my God, how could you do that? Well, why not? God, from all eternity, knew that I would pray for those people. And you say, but they don't deserve it. And I say, neither do I. And neither do you. Jesus is the one who merits the Father's grace. And so we're all sinners, and so we pray for each other. And you can be an effective power for salvation just by willing it, just by praying. That's what happens when we enter in to the life of Christ. Are Mormon baptisms recognized? No. Are Episcopalian confirmations recognized? No. You, for valid baptism, like I said before, you need valid form and matter. Now, the Mormons have baptism, but if you ask them who the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is, they, have, they, they don't believe what we believe. And Mormons aren't really Christian. Now, they would contest that, but they're not Christian. Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christian. Episcopalians are very much Christian, very Christian. However, they do not have valid holy orders. They do not have apostolic succession. Now some would contend with that too. And so if you don't have a valid bishop, validly ordained, you can't have consecration. If you don't have the valid sacrament of holy orders, because only a, a bishop or a priest can administer confirmation, then you can't have valid confirmation. How can how can some of us be so in love with God and others not? Does everyone receive the gift of faith? Do some say no thanks? Well, God wills not the death of any sinner. God wills that everyone be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God provides sufficient grace for everyone to be saved without exception. However, yes indeed, some say no. How do you say no? Well, you say no by choosing evil and rejecting good rather than choosing good and rejecting evil. Uh, that's quite simply, and even St. Paul said, even the pagans have no excuse because the natural law is written in the heart of every man. The natural law, which is a reflection of the divine law, that guides our actions. And so we don't have an excuse. Everyone has it in their heart, the inspiration to do good and avoid evil. 
The Eucharist does not exist in the Lutheran and Episcopalian Church. True or false? True. It does not. Once again, you have to have a validly ordained priesthood. You need valid holy orders for five of the seven sacraments, right? Only a priest or bishop can confect the Eucharist. You can't be a priest or bishop without valid holy orders, the sacrament. All right, confirmation, the same. Confession or penance, reconciliation, also. Okay, anointing of the sick, holy orders itself. Okay, baptism and matrimony are the only two sacraments where you don't need a validly ordained priesthood, the sacrament of holy orders. Sometimes at Mass during the readings, the person done doing the reading will change the wording to be politically correct, such as all men will be changed to all people or all brothers changed to, to add the word sisters. How do you feel about this? Well, basically I say this. Do what the church does. Now, there's two kinds of inclusive language. There's what you could call vertical inclusive language and horizontal inclusive language. Uh, I myself at Mass will sometimes say things like, instead of pray brethren, I'll say pray brothers and sisters that your sacrifice and mine may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. That's okay to do that. Uh, you, you can't change the meaning of the text uh, because it even says in the sacramentary, it gives you a couple of options. You know, it can say, you can say pray friends. That's one of the options. So horizontal inclusive language where, but I'll tell you something, it's really funny. The traditional usage where it says, you know, uses the masculine, uh, in most Romance languages, uh, that's inclusive. You know, when you mean men, men, masculine, or men and women, that's inclusive, and you use the masculine form. You know, in Spanish, it's like that. You, you know, if it's, if it's um, ours and it's masculine, nuestro, nuestra, if it's feminine, but if you're talking about both inclusive, nuestro, the masculine form. And that's inclusive, actually. So there's a kind of an inversion of reality there. Inclusive language really is what we've used all along. And there's no intention to, to eliminate women in, in any way whatsoever. That's not the meaning of that whatsoever. Uh, so we, but I don't like to mess with the language in general. Now, there's another kind of inclusive language, vertical inclusive language. That's the language of speaking of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, saying His will, God's will, His will. You know, God our Father, don't mess with that. You mess with that, you're messing with the faith. God didn't reveal himself as mother. He revealed himself as father. And I don't have a better idea than God. Now, God isn't gender. You know, God doesn't admit of gender. God transcends gender. God includes feminine and masculine, both, because he's the creator. God created us, male and female, he created us. Nothing that's created didn't come from God. And so God transcends gender, but God has revealed himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, when Jesus assumed a human nature, you better believe it's masculine. Jesus is the Son of God, and his human nature is a masculine human nature, and, and you know, it's pagan worship to put up Christa on the cross. Pagan worship. And, you know, run, if you ever see that. I, I wouldn't even stay in a place that did, did that. That's a, that's a sacrilege beyond imagination. If St. Ambrose, Ambrose uh, says that the power of the blessing prevails, then why does it matter if the Eucharist is made from unleavened bread? Well, it's still valid, okay? Let's say in the Roman Rite, which prescribes unleavened bread, let's say you would use leavened bread. Is it still valid? Yes. You still have a valid mass. Yes, if it's leavened bread. Leavened bread means there's yeast, right? It's still valid, but it's illicit. Why? 
because Jesus gave the church the power to administer the sacraments and to prescribe discipline. And if the church says in the West that we use unleavened bread, then we use unleavened bread. And I don't have a better idea than Christ's own body, than the magisterium. Why do we use unleavened bread? Because that's what was used at the Paschal meal. That's what Jesus offered up. And so that matter of the original offering of the Eucharist was unleavened bread. But is leavened bread, as is sometimes used in the East, is that valid matter? Yes, it's valid matter. It's licit in the East, but illicit in the West. And so if you used uh, leavened bread uh, in, the, in the Latin rite, Roman rite, it's still valid, but it's illicit. I don't want to do illegal things in the church. God's not going to smile on me for disobeying the church. And so we do what the, the church prescribes. Is the validity of the sacrament of baptism affected by the fact that neither godparent is a practicing Catholic? Fallen away. No, the validity is not affected by that. The, it's still valid. What you need is the intention of the minister. He intends to baptize. He has lit, uh, valid form and matter. Water, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The baptism's valid. Don't worry about it. Why, why isn't marriage outside the Catholic Church seen as valid marriage? Oh, it is. Marriage outside the Catholic Church is valid for someone who's not Catholic. Right? Hey, two Lutherans get married in the Lutheran Church. That's a valid marriage. They exchange vows. You better believe that's a valid marriage. But for a Catholic to marry outside the church and to have defective form, that's not valid for a Catholic. Why? Because Catholics are held to Catholic discipline in Catholic worship. And so that's why people that are, they drift away from the church and let's say they, they would get married um, by justice of the peace or something. Um, they have a very simple way to be reconciled. It's called a defective form annulment. They don't have to go through the whole process to see if their marriage was invalid to begin with. Well, we know it was because we didn't have the, the valid form of the marriage, defective form. No, no witness, no priest deacon to witness it in the name of the church. Defective form, so it's, it's not valid. For a Catholic, it's not valid to be married outside of the Catholic Church. Uh, what step do I need to do if I'm not sure whether I was confirmed? Well, if you can, you should go to the parish that you think maybe you were confirmed in and check. They record those things. Uh, if you can't do that for some odd reason, um, you can, a, a sacrament when we're not sure, remember the three sacraments I told you couldn't be repeated, baptism, confirmation, and holy orders? If you're not sure if you were validly baptized, if you're not sure if you were validly confirmed, you, don't, you can't get the proof, the documentation, you can go to your parish priest and tell him that. And after a, a search or a review, he said, well, I, we can't find anything. You can have what's called a conditional administration of the sacrament. Conditional baptism, conditional confirmation. You know, if you, if you haven't, if you have not received baptism, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So it's a conditional administration of the sacrament. Normally, you can find out, though, if you were baptized or confirmed, because it's in the registration of parishes, and they keep it forever. Unless it was burned up or something, and you really don't know, then, uh, then you can be conditionally baptized or confirmed. Where does it say, and why does it say, I've, I saved this one to last. I, I don't, I, I've, I've gone through this a couple times before. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'm, I'm going to just conclude with this. Because someone gave me an article a little earlier. And sometimes, you know, you can be upset by these articles that you see in the media or on television or something. Don't, don't be upset by these things. One of the reasons we're doing this course for you in the catechism, uh, we, we want you to be confirmed in the faith. I want you to be solid in the faith. Your bishop wants you to be solid in the faith. If you're solid in the faith, you're less likely to become upset 
when something bad goes on because you know that you're right. You know you have the faith. You're not threatened by some of the bad things that go on. A lady gave me a, an article in it, said that 10 groups in the church are signing petitions uh, like they did in, in France and Germany, and they're going to present these petitions to the Pope. You know, you get enough like a ballot, you know, like Proposition XYZ in California, right? You, you have that, that method. Well, and so they're going to get enough signatures, and they're going to show the Pope what they think. And they're going to say, look, we want women ordained priests. We want celibacy to be optional. We want this. We want the other thing. So what? <laughs> The Catholic Church never was, is not, nor will it ever be a democracy. And we do not rule by consensus. Jesus said at Caesarea Philippi, Who do men say that I am? He took a Gallup poll. And some said John the Baptist, and some said Elijah, and some said Jeremiah. We add them all up. 14 said Jeremiah, 26 said Elijah. What happened? Did Jesus say, oops, most of them said I must be Jeremiah, so I guess I am. No. <laughs> One man had the answer. Peter, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus said, for, for I for my part, Peter, declare to you that you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. Listen, folks. Your faith is built on a rock. And those issues are clear. Those issues are clear. The Holy Father recently defined the question of women's ordination, so-called. It's not possible. No more could you consecrate that Coca-Cola I told you about into the blood of Christ. Then can a woman be, woman be ordained a priest and not because she's less than a man. A woman is every bit a Christian and a human is a man. And I'll tell you, women are probably smarter than men. They're certainly better looking. And so there isn't anything. There, there's, there, you're not cheated there. But let me tell you something. I think one of the most noble and highest things in the universe is to be a mother. I will never be one. But I'm not getting up a petition to say that it's unfair. We have to act in accordance with our nature. That's how we become happy and at peace. And so look, I'm going to clarify it once and for all. Where does it say and why does it say that women cannot be priests? I'm asking as a young Catholic, and I would like to defend the church when confronted on this issue. It is an important issue, and so I'm going to say it one more time. It is a part of the doctrine of the faith. Why? Because it's one of the seven sacraments that we talked about today. Holy orders is one of the seven sacraments instituted by Jesus Christ. On Holy Thursday at the Last Supper, he called twelve, and he instituted the priesthood and the Holy Eucharist. All twelve of them were men, and his mother, the most noble, the most beautiful, the most holy of creatures, was not among them. And it's not because she was less than them. She's more than all of them. No priest that ever lived is more holy, beautiful, and noble than that woman, Our Lady. And so Jesus himself instituted the priesthood at the Last Supper, the day before he suffered and died on the cross. Twelve he called. Twelve were men. Twelve men. No women, no Christa instituted the priesthood. Christ the Lord instituted the priesthood. I don't have a better idea than God. We don't make it up as we go along. We accept what we've received and we hand it on faithfully. That's the faith. Don't try to mess with it. Don't try to water it down. If you find it hard to accept, pray. And God will enlighten your understanding. The priesthood was established by Christ. As such, it's an essential element of the faith because it's one of the seven sacraments. As such, you will find it in three places. Sacred Scripture, I just talked about that. 
That's in the Bible, the Gospel. Sacred tradition from the beginning. The apostolic teaching, the apostolic tradition is only men can be called to the sacrament of holy orders. That tradition has passed down unbroken throughout the ages. And magisterial teaching, it is only the magisterium which can authentically and authoritatively interpret the word of God, whether written in the Bible or spoken and handed down through apostolic tradition. And so the witness of tradition is as unanimous as the witness of scripture and magisterial teaching has remained the same. It's part of the doctrine of the faith. It's part of the truth. And the truth, because it is Jesus, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as the letter to the Hebrews says, therefore, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. And let me tell you the punchline. Anyone who obstinately refuses to accept that teaching in virtue of the act of the refusal to accept that teaching is excommunicated latte sententiae because that teaching is part of the doctrine of the faith and by definition, the definition of heresy, a willful, obstinate, post-baptismal denial of a truth of the faith which must be believed with Catholic and divine faith. The Holy Father said, that's the case. The Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith affirmed what the Holy Father said and said, that's the case. The case is closed. And anyone, anyone, be they bishop, priest, religious, or lay faithful who goes against that, let them know and let them know well. They cut themselves off from the body of Christ for they refuse to accept a matter of the doctrine of the faith. As the Holy Father said, a matter of the utmost importance because it concerns the very divine constitution of the church herself. And so let the case be closed. Let no one frighten you with that kind of talk and know very well that if it ever happens that someone goes against that teaching and breaks from the apostolic faith, that is not where Christ is residing. That is not the true church. That will be schismatic. That will be heretical. Stay far away from false teaching, for it is poison, it is darkness, and it is death. Rather, abide in the light, for the light is truth. And Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I received a little letter here or a flyer from someone. It's entitled, What is the Responsibility of Catholic Political Leaders to the Moral Law of the Church? And then it goes on to talk about what happened concerning this partial uh, birth abortion ban, you know, in California. We voted on it. Now, partial birth abortions, abortion is, is bad enough. But these partial birth abortions are closer to infanticide than anything. Uh, they're horrible. I, I don't want to go into it, but you know what it is. I, I don't have to, to tell you that. Well, on May 31, 1996, under California's Capitol Dome, the position of the Holy Father, the bishops, cardinals, was totally ignored by a great many Catholic legislators. Assembly Bill 2984, a measure to ban partial birth abortions in California unless specific requirements were met, was defeated by a vote of 36 to 35 by the California Assembly. <clears throat> it goes on to list a majority of the Catholics in the Assembly who voted against this state ban. Catholics who voted against this. In other words, they voted to allow partial birth abortions. Where are they in terms of the faith? I'll tell you another safe bet that I can make. The day is coming 
sooner rather than later, I hope, where the bishops, having girded their loins and stiffened their backbones, will begin to excommunicate those who take positions like that. It is totally unconscionable, unthinkable, and hellish that anyone could claim to be Catholic and vote for that kind of abomination in a state or federal government. You are not Catholic, legislators, senators, whoever you are. You're not Catholic. And the bishops wake up and excommunicate them as an act of charity because it's gone on too long, much too long. Death is reigning in this country, and a legacy of death is not what we want to hand on, not in the annals of the church in this country or the country itself. And so where do those people stand? What's the duty of Catholic legislators? To vote a Catholic conscience. And you can't be Catholic with a conscience formed to that which is evil. Which, that which radiates death. That's not a Catholic conscience. That's not Catholicism. That's diabolic. That's destructive. And so you cannot say, oh, but I'm Catholic, but I support these partial birth abortions or any abortion. No, you're not. You're Catholic in name, but not in fact. That's a reality. My belief is that they have excommunicated themselves in virtue of that act. You will find soon that there will be courageous bishops like Bishop Bruskowitz in Lincoln, Nebraska, like the Archbishop, <laughs> like the Archbishop of Omaha, Nebraska now, that there will be bishops who follow suit, who not tied up with what's so-called politically correct will begin to do what's right, will begin to testify to the truth. And even if, like Jesus, they have to be lifted up on a cross because of that, they, they'll do it. And they'll be accounted great in the kingdom of heaven for having that kind of courage and leadership. And we must pray very much, for they have a difficult job, and it's not easy. Another question. It says in the Bible, all sins will be forgiven except for sins against the Holy Ghost. What is a sin against the Holy Ghost? Okay, the only sin that can't be forgiven is final impenitence. That's what that really means. That's the only sin that can't be forgiven. Any sin can be forgiven if we ask for forgiveness. The only sin, the real sin against the Holy Spirit, that can't be forgiven is in final impenitence. I refuse to repent. You go right to your death saying, I will not repent. So God wants to give forgiveness for every sin, of course. But if you say, I don't repent, I'm not sorry, final impenitence, that's the sin against the Holy Spirit. In regards to form and matter, a friend's response to the eggs and sugar recipe for Eucharistic bread, which I mentioned last month, was that even though the matter wasn't the best, never mind the best, it wasn't at all. It's not, it's not that it isn't the best. It's not valid matter, period. Jesus wouldn't deny himself being given to those who received the cake, believing it was truly him. That's the kind of weak-minded thinking that destroys faith. That is totally fallacious. What's my response? Can a person's belief in what they are receiving affect Christ's presence, no, 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 that's an ancient heresy that was condemned centuries ago. You can believe until you're blue in the face that this is a Boston cream pie, but that ain't gonna change it, not one bit. And you can believe that that invalid matter is Christ until you turn purple but it's not going to turn in to the body and blood of Christ because it's not your faith which affects the sacramental presence. It's the form, the words of consecration and valid matter, and that's the only thing that will make Christ present in the Eucharist. And the amount of faith that you have or lack thereof 
will not affect the objective presence of the Lord in the Eucharist. Impossible. Absolutely impossible. Of course, faith is important. It concerns our subjective disposition, and we receive more the greater our faith is. But you do not will Christ into existence. That kind of shallow, soft thinking is what leads to the conclusion that any of us can consecrate. Oh, sure, I was home. Somebody that used to teach in a certain diocese for many years who perverted the faith of many is now in my home diocese teaching. And someone asked him, what if we don't have a priest, Dr. So-and-so? Can we confect the Eucharist? Can we consecrate? Of course, we're all priests. What a lie. And so what happens with that kind of misinformation? People begin to believe it. They begin to play games. They begin to say the words of consecration over cookies and cream. What happens? Nothing happens. That's what happens. Nothing happens. No consecration, no body and blood of the Lord. Be soft-hearted. Don't be soft-headed. <laughs> listen to the teaching of the church. Accept it for what it is. And don't listen to those specious arguments. In our parish, we have general confession. We write our sins on a paper. The priest reads them to himself. Then he burns the paper and gives us individual absolution while we are standing there. Is this valid? Well, I'm not quite sure exactly what is done. I don't know why you would write your sins on a paper. If you wrote them on a paper and gave them to the priest right there, face to face, why wouldn't you tell them? No, auricular confession is necessary. You have to articulate your sins to the priest. You have to speak your sins to the priest. That's part of the matter of the sacrament. In this diocese, General confession and general absolution are not permitted. And so, what do you do? You go to confession. You confess your sins. You receive absolution. You go on, the next guy goes in. That's the way we do it. That's the way the church does it. Can you explain why the bishops allow condoms in some circumstances? Well, they don't. <laughs> But you say, but yes, they do. In France, you know, the Conference of Bishops said so. In the fourth century, in the early fifth century, in the East, almost every bishop went over to the Arian heresy. And St. Athanasius alone stood fast in the true faith. A bishop, a cardinal, a pope, anyone does not have the ability to change the unchanging teaching of Jesus Christ. Now what's the teaching? The use of condoms is a means of artificial contraception. Is it, is it the use permitted? No. But to spread AIDS, is it permitted? To stop the spread of AIDS, is it permitted? No, because why? We could give us, we could, in that statement, we could make, be making an unwitting statement that we're condoning that kind of sexual activity. And, and we're not. We're not. Promiscuous sexual activity, whether homosexual or heterosexual, is grossly, intrinsically evil. In the current teaching, can we make an exception? No. But the bishops did it in France. They're wrong. They're wrong. That's all there is to it. And I assure you they've been corrected by the Holy See. And if they push their luck, they'll be corrected more forcefully. So the person who wrote this was confused, and rightly so. I'm confused by this. Well, don't be confused. Some people will go off. Even bishops can go off. They mean well. No one did that out of malice. They mean well. But the norm is, the teaching is, it's not permitted. On the way back to my pew from communion, I saw a host on the floor. 
I picked up the host, and although it was very dirty, I was going to consume it. My friend said we should give it to the priest. He would know what, what to do. What, what would you do in that circumstance? Well, normally, when you find a host, if it's not too dirty and messed up, you would consume it. But let's say you find one that you just don't want to take a chance doing that. The correct thing, give it to the priest. That was correct. The, what does the priest do with it? Well, he should place it in a container of water, in a ciborium with water in it, and allow it to dissolve. Allow it to dissolve in the water, and then he would pour that water in the ground or down the sacrarium. That would be the correct way uh, to deal with that. Uh, a lot of times, sadly, we, we find this. Usually, I'll just consume the host, but if, you know, it, it's... Uh, really been trodden underfoot or something and, and you don't want to do that, that's all right. Give it to the priest. He'll dissolve it in water. You say that those who are suffering can be suffering because God really loves you. What if you are not suffering? Does he not love you as much? It's <laughs> a good question. No, my answer to you is stay tuned. And if you have any doubt, you might speak to the good Lord and say, Lord, do you really love me? <laughs> of course, God loves everyone. The meaning of that, however, is those who suffer, God has a special predilection for those souls. Why? Because they come so close to Christ. They meet the crucified Christ in their suffering. And in a manner of speaking, analogously speaking, yes, God does give the greatest share of his suffering to those that he wants to draw closest to himself. But it doesn't mean he doesn't love the rest of us. You know, if I were in sports and I were a boxer and I had a coach who loved me uh, and he wouldn't put me in the heavyweight championship, would I think, oh, you don't want what's best for me, coach. How come I'm not fighting for the heavyweight championship, because you'll get knocked out. That's why you're not ready. So how about trying it at a lower level? Well, we all undergo certain difficulties in life, certain sufferings at some level, emotional, if not physical, spiritual. We have trials and tribulations. And I have a good friend who's a Carmelite prioress. And she has often said to us, but Father, I've had such a good life. I've not suffered at all. I've had a wonderful life. Where does that leave me? And I tell her, oh, Mother, you've, you've, lo you've lived a beautifully penitential life. You don't recognize it because you're so in love with the Lord. But stay tuned. It's not over yet. You haven't, gone, you haven't died and gone to heaven. You know, in, in, in one day, God can bestow an infinity of suffering on a soul. You know, a, a thousand years are like a, a day or an hour or a minute come and gone to the Lord. So, so don't, don't worry about that. God loves you, and he loves you with a tremendous love, an infinite love. And because he preserves us today from suffering, that's a sign of love too. But if tomorrow he chooses to love you with a different embrace, then don't be afraid. It's just a sign of his love. He's not rejecting you. He's drawing you closer. I remember a certain couple talking to a Protestant minister who was a great preacher, and they were lamenting the fact that they, they had a, a severely crippled and, and handicapped child that was born to them. And they said, is it because God perhaps doesn't love us as much, or is this punishment of some kind? And, and this Protestant minister who was born with cerebral palsy, said to them, oh, no, no. He said, God just trusts you more than he does most people to bring up this beautiful child. God trusts you more to give you such a blessing to nurture and educate that child, to love that child all the way to the kingdom. No, God's not punishing you. God's blessing you. God's showing you how much he loves you and how much he trusts you. And so God loves us all. 
and he does trust us all because he's entrusted us with his son in the Eucharist. He's entrusted us with his bride, the church. He's entrusted us with everything good and true and holy and noble. Love is repaid by love alone.